Well, shalom, dear friends, and welcome to our Bible study on the book of Genesis. This episode is going to be chapter 37, and chapter 37 is kind of a turning point in the narrative of uh, Genesis. Uh, from chapter 37 uh, on to the, uh, up until the last chapter, uh, chapter 50 of Genesis, the main character is Joseph, Yosef. And uh, with one exception, and that's chapter 38, which for some strange reason focuses on uh, Judah. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to uh, chapter 38. But uh, about 14 chapters, 13, 14 chapters are going to be focused on the life of Joseph. And um, that is more chapters than are devoted to any of the other uh, main characters. Um, so... We'll talk about some of the possible reasons uh, for that uh, as we do our uh, preliminary uh, study, our background uh, material from my PowerPoint. Uh, like with the other videos, if you would prefer just to do the verse-by-verse -verse, uh, study, I encourage you at this point to uh, fast forward in the video until you come to the um, pictures of the, um, not the word processor, but the uh, Bible study software. And uh, you can start the video uh, then. Uh, for those of you who would prefer to go through the uh, preliminary material, we will do that uh, right now. I have been advertising a book of mine that was published uh, recently called Nazarene Essene Theology. It's basically a, basically a, a systematic theology from the perspective of the Nazarene Essenes, the group to which Jesus and his uh, disciples were associated with which they were associated, uh, covers from uh, Genesis to Revelation. Um, it's about a 650-page book, and the first 250 uh, pages uh, deal with the material from the book of Genesis. Um, so if you feel like that might be a help to you, um, this book and uh, all of my books that I've written are readily available on Amazon. Some of them are located at some other um, a book uh, uh, providers, but Amazon is the, the best place to, uh, to get these books. We've also been looking at a series of uh, Bible charts. Uh, this is the one that we'll be on uh, to the end of this series. It's called The Age of Promise. Um, of course, as we've pointed out before, God makes promises from Genesis to Revelation throughout all the dispensations or historical periods of time in the Bible. Uh, but the promises in this chapter are the uh, like the main focal point. They are the, uh, the main theme and plot of, uh, of this part of the uh, Bible. Uh, we have uh, various covenants uh, based on, um, uh, on God's promises. Um, the main one that we're interested in this particular period is the Abrahamic covenant, which was renewed with his sons, uh, Itzach and Yaakov, who are uh, illustrated here on the chart. Uh, today we are, uh, focusing more on the fourth generation of the patriarchs, and, uh, the, uh, spotlight is going to be on Yosef. I do want to talk a little bit about why I think uh, Joseph becomes the main character for so much of the last portion of Genesis. And uh, we will go to the head of the column here and talk about the firstborn of all of Yaakov's sons, Reuven, or Reuben. Uh, Reuben is the eldest. He should be uh, understood to be the, uh, as the firstborn, he would get a double portion of the estate. Uh, when his father passed away, um, uh, he, he he would, you know, be considered the uh, eldest of the son, so he would be kind of the leader of the family. But he actually uh, forfeits that uh, in an act that we uh, covered, um, uh, I think, a couple of chapters ago, when Reuben uh, slept with one of his father's uh, concubines. Bilha and Zilpa were the two maidservant girls of Leah and uh, Rachel, and I think it was Bilha that Reuben uh, slept with. And in doing so, 
uh, he uh, humiliated uh, his his father and uh, and and lost the uh, the privileges that he would have had as the firstborn. So he kind of disqualifies himself uh, as the uh, as the firstborn son. Shimon was the um, uh, second in line. But he and Levi, um, kind of their claim to fame is that when their sister Dina was uh, was raped and maybe kidnapped um, in the house of uh, Shkem, who was the son of Hamor, uh, so uh, I think the city was named after him. But uh, after the rape of uh, of Dina, Shimon and Levi kind of took the law into their own hands and massacred the residents of uh, of the city of Shechem, and uh, of course got their their daughter back. But she had been humbled by um, uh, by being uh, raped by him. But this act of, of violence of uh, killing all these uh, people in Shechem and uh, and then uh, destroying their city um, was not pleasing in the sight of the father uh, Yaakov. And so uh, they are going to be disqualified from the rights and privileges of the eldest and then the second and third eldest uh, son because of their behaviors. Well, the, the blessing of the firstborn is going to fall on Yehuda or Judah. And uh, you'll notice that the red ribbon of salvation runs through uh, his uh, his name, his uh, family, his tribe. Uh, this is the tribe from which the kings will emerge. Uh, David the first, he's not the first king of Israel. Saul of the tribe of Benjamin was the uh, was the first king. Uh, but I think that was kind of a false start. Uh, I think uh, all along God's choice was that David would be the first king. And uh, he is from the tribe of Judah. And then God makes a covenant with uh, David, David, uh, that that uh, his family would be the family that's chosen to produce all the legitimate kings of uh, Israel. So um, there are those four. Judah gets these uh, privileges of the firstborn. Uh, so why Joseph? Well, uh, Joseph is the uh, firstborn son of uh, of uh, Yaakov's favorite wife, Rachel. And you'll remember that Rachel was uh, barren for a long time. But then finally, while they were still living in Syria, Yosef uh, was born. He became his father's favorite. And, and we'll see in the text for today uh, some of the ways that Yaakov uh, favored him and uh, kind of made him um, um, unsatisfactory to the rest of the uh, the, the brothers uh, in in the family. So why so much uh, focus, why so much emphasis on Yosef? He's not the firstborn. He's not a Levite uh, from which tribe the uh, the priests of Israel and the uh, like the religious workers, the Levites in the tabernacle and temple emerged from that. Um, no, not not at all. So uh, why focus on Yosef? And I think the answer to that question, the Bible doesn't uh, specifically um, say, you know, why Joseph is uh, in the limelight uh, so much in this portion of uh, Genesis. But I think um, I, as we study the story of Joseph, I think we will see a lot of parallel between Yosef and Yeshua, Jesus. Uh, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Uh, many of the events in the life of Yosef will uh, parallel those of uh, Yeshua. So I think the, the life of Yosef is told in such great detail because his life will teach us so much about Yeshua. Help us as readers of the Old Testament to identify Yeshua and uh, kind of confirm his identity and all the characteristics that he had that would qualify him to be our Savior and uh, make him worthy of the trust and faith uh, that we can put in him and, and be saved and have eternal life and have our lives uh, blessed by God, have our lives sanctified by him, and then anticipate the, um, uh, the resurrection of the righteous and living uh, forever in the uh, presence and company of our, uh, our 
triune God. So that's why I think Joseph is the subject, because he is going to be a type of the Messiah, of the uh, Christ. I'm keeping this map uh, in our um, uh, preparatory material here, uh, just because uh, this map uh, shows and defines in Bible verses, Genesis 13 and 15, the dimensions of the promised land. It runs from the river of Egypt on the west, that'd be the Nile River, uh, to the river Euphrates on the north and the east. So uh, this area that I'm uh, circling with my pointer is uh, kind of rough dimensions of the promised land. And uh, the full extent of that promised land has uh, was never in biblical times occupied by the chosen people. And even today, it is uh, only a small portion of that is occupied by the modern state of Israel. So uh, if that promise of God is kept, that the chosen people will someday occupy all that territory, when will that be? Well, my bet is that it would be during the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom, where Yeshua uh, returns to earth in power and great glory, sits on a throne in Jerusalem, and really rules the world. Uh, but his people, his race, the Jewish people, the state of Israel, uh, will occupy all of this land uh, kind of in the central uh, part of this uh, map. So, I mean, as far as modern uh, countries go, uh, the Promised Land uh, occupies the eastern portions of uh, Egypt, uh, the whole of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, then we've got um, uh, Saudi Arabia kind of to the south and the east. We've got the modern state of Georgia, uh, Lebanon and Syria to the, uh, to the north, Iraq in the northeast. So the boundary is going to be kind of where the uh, boundary of Iraq and Iran uh, are. And again, I would I would place the uh, full um, fulfillment of, of of these prophecies uh, in the uh, millennial kingdom. We've also been looking at the genealogy or the family tree of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. Uh, Terah was the father of. Uh, of uh, Haran, Nahor, and Avram. Then we have focused really on Avraham's branch of that family tree. Uh, his promised son was Yitzhak, who would be the, uh, uh, through his son Yaakov, and uh, Yaakov's sons would produce the nation of the Israelites. And we just talked about the land that they would uh, eventually occupy uh, but in biblical times, it's kind of the colorful uh, part of the map that we're looking at here. Uh, there's the state of uh, Israel. I should have put a little arrow there, uh, but this is Israel. Uh, Isaac had another son named Esav, uh, or Esau, and uh, he is the uh, ancestor of the Edomites. So uh, here we have Edom down here in the purple. <laughs> Uh, Abraham also had another son, Ishmael, by the uh, by Sarah's maidservant Hagar, and Ishmael uh, became the ancestor of the uh, uh, country or the nation of the Ishmaelites. I have added the Ishmaelites down here on the southern uh, kind of edge of the map, but actually the location where the Ishmaelites lived is uh, way further south. Uh, there's one other person uh, um, who's not indicated on the map, uh, but that was Lot who came with uh, Abraham and Sarah into the promised land uh, after their father uh, Terah uh, died. Uh, Lot was uh, Abraham's nephew. He was a uh, son. Oh, here he is over here. Uh, he was a da uh, He was the. Uh, 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 the son of Haran, who died before they reached Haran in uh, uh, in Syria. And so Lot came to the promised land. Uh, he had two daughters uh, that um, uh, he actually ended up impregnating uh, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they produced the Moabites and the Ammonites, uh, two other nations. 
Uh, the, the reason I emphasize this is because God repeatedly calls uh, Abraham the father of many nations, uh, made you the father of many nations. So Israel is the one that we're really interested in, uh, but all of these other um, uh, nations, here's Ammon, uh, the, uh, Ammon is, uh, the city of Ammon is actually the capital of modern day uh, Jordan. And then Moab is uh, is here, the descendants of uh, Ammon and uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Uh, that's where they live. So, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind as far as uh, family background. Here we've got the four uh, women who were an important part of Yaakov's uh, uh, life. Uh, two legitimate uh, wives, uh, and then two maidservants. In some places, the maidservants are called <clears throat> uh, concubines. In some places, they're called wives. So I would just, I guess I would categorize, categorize them as kind of second class or second level uh, wives. The two uh, maidservants uh, gave birth to two sons, God and Asher, and Don and Naphtali. And uh, in our lesson for today, Yosef is going to be spending some time uh, with them. Uh, this is a map of the uh, travels of uh, Yosef, including his, um, his uh, being taken to uh, Egypt, to the land of Goshen. Uh, but to, for uh, today, uh, today, what we're interested in is this uh, purple line uh, where the family comes from up north around Shkem, uh, down here to uh, Hebron. And uh, then uh, 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 part of the story today is Joseph is going to go in search of his shepherd uh, brothers who are out keeping watch over the flocks. <laughs> so uh, he travels first uh, to uh, Shkem, doesn't find them, goes up to Dothan. So these are the travels that we'll be talking about. Uh, today and actually this green arrow uh, as uh, as well. <clears throat> so that's the end of our PowerPoint. We will uh, jump right in and go to our uh, text for today. Genesis 37, 1. Now Yaakov dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. So uh, when it talks about his father, it's talking about uh, uh, Isaac was his, uh, what? Uh, his actual father, his birth father. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, but all, but this uh, the term would include his grandfather. The Hebrew language doesn't really have a word for, uh, at least the biblical Hebrew language doesn't have a, a word for uh, grandfather. I think in modern Hebrew, it's Saba. Um, I believe is is uh, correct, but biblical Hebrew didn't have that. So we're talking about the earlier generations of the uh, uh, of the chosen uh, people, and it says he was a stranger in the land, uh, a magur, um, uh, a magur actually, uh, which is a, the noun form of the verb uh, to uh, what uh, to sojourn. Uh, to travel in a land that you don't uh, possess. So um, uh, that was the status of the uh, first, uh, actually all four uh, uh, generations of the uh, patriarchs in the land of Canaan. So uh, the only land that they ended up possessing, in spite of the fact that God had promised them that they would uh, possess all of the uh, promised land that we uh, talked about when we looked at the uh, at the map. Uh, the only real estate that they actually owned were the burial plots, uh, one in Hebron, one in uh, Shechem, uh, that were purchased, uh, one by Abraham as a burial place for his wife, Sarah, and uh, the other by Jacob, uh, Yaakov, uh, for his son, uh, Yosef. Um, kind of one indication that Yosef was his uh, favorite son. Also want to talk about the land of Canaan uh, on the uh, biblical maps that we look at uh, in this period of history. Uh, the whole land that we focus on in the biblical era as the promised land is called Canaan. 
because the Canaanite tribes, and there were a variety of them, the Hittites and Hivites and Perizzites and so on, all the Ite tribes, uh, were, were kind of generally the the uh, the Canaanite. <laughs> And uh, the Canaanites were kind of on probation uh, with God. Uh, they had forsaken the worship uh, and the uh, uh, and a relationship with the one true God. Uh, they worshipped false gods. Uh, their religion, uh, their false religion, led them to a lot of immoral acts. But yet they occupied the land that God wanted to give to his uh, chosen people. So um, uh, on the one hand, he blesses them while they are in the land of Canaan. But uh, all the evil that was taking place in Canaan put that land on um, uh, like God's um, uh, agenda for a judgment. But he's going to give them more time than just the time that the patriarchs uh, spent in the land of Canaan. So they don't occupy any of it, and the people who live there are evil and wicked and ungodly. So God doesn't want intermarriages between the chosen people and the ungodly. Uh, we've seen that expressed by Rebecca and uh, by Abraham and Sarah, by sending Eleazar, the household servant, up to Syria to the extended family to marry someone uh, within the family, to, to find a, uh, a wife, Rivka, for, um, uh, for uh, Isaac. So, you know, there, there are these two people groups that are interacting, usually fairly well with each other, uh, but the Canaanites are slated for judgments. And uh, so one of the reasons uh, that uh, Yosef is going to end up in Egypt is because he will draw the rest of his family to Egypt with him. And then after that time, uh, the land of Canaan will be ripe for judgment and will experience that judgment under Joshua. Uh, that's a good background to understanding the land and the people who lived in it at the time of the patriarchs. Uh, but that will not come until the uh, the book of uh, Joshua. So uh, verse 2, this is the history uh, of, uh, uh, of Yaakov, uh, the Toledot, the, uh, uh, the, um, the genealogy, uh, you could say, of uh, Yaakov, who is the uh, third generation of the patriarchs, Yosef being the fourth. Yosef being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilha and Zilpah. And uh, we looked at those on the chart of the, uh, you know, the family tree and the wives. Um, yeah, I believe it was Bilha that Reuben had uh, slept with and discredited himself and humiliated his father. Uh, so uh, who were her sons? Was it um, uh, God and Asher? And then Zilpah's uh, were uh, Naphtali and uh, and who else? Uh, it doesn't matter. You can you can look back at the chart and see. Uh, anyway, um, uh, but here Bilhah and Zilpah are called his father's wives, and Yosef brought a bad report of them uh, to his father. So the report may have just included the four sons here, the ones that uh, Yosef was hanging out with. Or it may have included uh, all the other uh, brothers. And this idea of Yosef bringing a bad report of them to his father, uh, we would call that a tattletale. And uh, even if he's telling the truth, nobody likes tattletales, including his brothers. So uh, this is just an indication. This is a little hint uh, of uh, the uh, less than favorable relationship that Joseph had with his other uh, brothers, and we'll see that develop as the uh, as we go through the verses. Now, Israel, uh, which is remember, is the uh, changed name for Yaakov. Israel loved Yosef more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age, um, and also he, that's Yaakov, made him Yosef a tunic of many colors. So let's talk about this, uh, the idea of Yosef being the son of his old age. It may just mean 
that um, uh, that uh, Yaakov favored him because his favorite wife, uh, Rachel, Rachel, had been barren for many years, and um, Yosef is like the second to last son that's born. And so uh, by the time that Yosef was, uh, was uh, born, um, Yaakov was an old man. He was in his 90s. Uh, the Dake Study Bible says he was 91 when Yosef was born. Uh, so he was an old man, and that could be all that it means. Some commentators, however, have suggested that uh, that Israel loved Yosef more than all of his uh, children, because in his old age, he had chosen Joseph to be uh, sort of like his power of attorney. Uh, Joseph would be responsible for doing the things and the activities that Yaakov wanted done, but he couldn't physically take care of it himself just because of his age. Uh, he would look after him if he was ill or something like that. So Joseph had been appointed as a caretaker. And because Yosef was spending so much time with his dad in that role of a caretaker, they developed a, a really awesome relationship. And uh, for that reason, Yosef became the, uh, the favored one. I mentioned earlier that uh, Ra uh, Rachel... Rachel was Yaakov's favorite. He was the she was the one that he fell in love with when he first arrived in Padan Aram, the uh, uh, the extended family compound up there in Syria, and uh, wanted to marry her. Made arrangements to marry her. I think he wanted only her, uh, but the custom in Padan Aram was that the oldest daughter had to marry first. So Laban, the father of the girls, sneaked Leah into Yaakov's tent late at night, and he ended up having sexual intercourse with her. And so she had to, so that marriage had to be legitimate. Um, so Yaakov was not happy about that arrangement, but he made a deal with Laban so that he would work another seven years uh, for uh, for marriage to Rachel, and he ended up marrying her. But Rachel was always the favored one. Uh, but the problem with her was that uh, she was barren for so many years. And then God opened her womb uh, towards the end of their stay in uh, in uh, Haran, in Padan Aram. And uh, she eventually uh, uh, had uh, not only Yosef, but also Benjamin, the youngest of the sons, uh, but tragically, she died uh, when uh, Benjamin was born. So uh, verse four. Oh, I also wanted to talk about the tunic of many colors or the coat of many colors, as it's often uh, called. So uh, let me uh, scroll my English text up and get my uh, coat of many colors. The word colors in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament is the, uh, the word pasim. Um, it's the plural of pas, which is a reference to the palm of the hand. Um, uh, and uh, so why is it a coat of many colors if it has if pasim has to do with the palm of the hand? Well, in the uh, third century uh, BC, the Hebrew, um, Old Testament was translated into the Greek language. It's called the Septuagint. And the Septuagint, Septuagint translators uh, used the word koi kilon, uh, a Greek word, which has to do with many and various colors. So uh, because uh, pasim is kind of a mystery word, like, um, you know, it wouldn't be a, a coat of many hands, uh, but but colors make sense, and that's what we assume the uh, schol the Septuagint scholars understood. So in almost all our English translations, it's coat of many colors. But many scholars who uh, understand uh, the Hebrew language and the Hebrew Bible to some depth believe that what this is talking about is a coat, an outer coat with sleeves that would reach to the palms of the hands. Uh, now, the attire of uh, this, uh, in this era of uh, biblical history, 
uh, men would wear an undergarment, and uh, I can't remember what that's uh, called, but it would be like a, a lightweight shirt, and that could have either long sleeves or short sleeves. Um, oftentimes it was long sleeves, but that was an undergarment. Then they also wore a ma'il or a katonet, um, which is an outer garment. And normally this was like a, uh, a long vest, uh, which you could um, uh, kind of uh, slip on and then tie or button up the front. And there were armholes um, and uh, a head, an opening for the head but usually no sleeves on the outer garment. Uh, the other arrangement would be kind of a very long piece of fabric with a hole in the middle for the head, and it would be worn like a poncho and secured with a belt and so forth. Uh, but still, on, on that arrangement, uh, there are no sleeves. Uh, but the significance of, of this garment, uh, these scholars believe, is that the outer garment had long sleeves and reached to the palms of uh, of Yosef's uh, hands, and that would mark him as uh, a very influential, wealthy, uh, respected um, uh, a kind of uh, person. And since his brothers did not wear that uh, kind of a garment, it it uh, it showed the favoritism of Yaakov for uh, Yosef. So uh, when his brothers uh, saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, uh, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. The way they saw this was certainly by the coat. That was kind of an outward uh, expression of, uh, of Jacob's favoritism. Uh, but also they could see it in, in the behavior, uh, in the relationship that Yosef had with their father that they didn't have, maybe wanted to have, and couldn't have because of that favoritism. And uh, also because um, um, uh, uh, because of Yosef's tattling on them, reporting them to their father and getting them into trouble with dad uh, that did, did not make him popular. Now, uh, the word hated here in English is actually kind of an extreme uh, word, um, which suggests um, animosity, hostility, uh, even a desire to visit violence on another person, um, even even to execute, like you know, to uh, abuse that person physically, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, that's what's involved in hatred. But in both of the biblical languages, group, uh, Greek and uh, Hebrew, it doesn't have that extreme um, uh, emotional uh, kind of content. And um, uh, so, so what is a good uh, word to uh, translate? Uh, the Hebrew is sina, and the uh, Greek is... Uh, um, Miseo, miseo, sina and miseo are the Greek and Hebrew words. Well, there really isn't an English uh, word, uh, so I've invented one uh, that I think more accurately describes what those original languages mean. Uh, my word is disprefer, to show preference to someone else. And I think that's in keeping with the biblical teaching on these uh, uh on these two words. Uh, for example, Yeshua at one point is uh, talking to his disciples, and he says, unless you hate your mother and father, uh, your wives and your children, your business and your house, um, your money, whatever, he says, if you don't hate those things, those people and those things, then you're not worthy of me. So did Jesus really, you know, want us to hate our relatives, our family members, and our jobs and all the other things we listed there. I don't think so, but he was talking about priorities. He was talking about dispreferring all of those people and things in contrast to him. So unless we've got our priorities right, Yeshua says, then, then we don't really qualify to be uh, faithful uh, disciples. 
So I'm going to say a disprefer. Now, having said that, I think that's a good guideline to translating and understanding uh, uh, Sina and Miseo uh, in the Bible. Uh, those two words are almost always translated hate. Um, but in this case, you know, I've I'm trying to say here that I think hate is usually too strong a um, uh, a word to use to translate those words. But in this case, it translates it very well. So they not only disprefer Yosef, but they despise him, and they're going to end up wanting to do a violence to him, as as we shall see. Okay, verse five. Now Yosef had a dream. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Now, the ability to have dreams and understand them or interpret them is, is going to be one of the chief characteristics of, uh, of, of Joseph. And, uh, you know, Yeshua had the uh, ability to um, interpret the future, to predict the future, kind of the gift of prophecy, and oftentimes prophecy involves dreams and visions and then just communications about the future. So, so that's one similarity uh, between uh, Yosef and uh, Yeshua. Both of them are able to foretell the future in a variety of different ways, dreams, visions, and uh, just prophetic uh, speech. Uh, so uh, Yosef had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. Uh, and we'll see why that was when we get the details of the dream. Uh, so he said to them, uh, please hear this dream, which I have dreamed. Uh, there we were binding sheaves in the field. Now, this is usually talking about in the days when like you would go out into the field and you'd harvest wheat, which was like a standing crop on stalks. And uh, like the first step in the harvesting process was to pluck the straw, the stalks out of the ground with the grain kind of in the head uh, of it there. My terminology is probably wrong. But if you're harvesting the fields, what you do is you pluck those stalks and you gather them into bundles in your arm. And then when you can't hold anymore, then you tie them together with strings or cords or something like that. And that bundle of stalks is a sheaf. And then later uh, they're harvested in, in, in the way grain was uh, harvested. But that, that's what uh, sheaves are. And uh, if, you're, if your bundle of sheaves is uh, big enough, you can stand it upright. But normally, you know, they would be uh, laid down because it would be kind of a unstable thing. So there we were binding sheaves in the field. And then behold, my sheaf stood upright, uh, stood, my sheaf arose and also and stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves all uh, around, uh, stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. So in other words, in the vision, Joseph sees his sheaf standing upright and there's all lying down. And uh, you don't have to be too intelligent to uh, get the gist of this vision, uh, the significance of it, uh, because of the, uh, what, the status of these uh, sheaves. Uh, Joseph's dream indicates that uh, uh, all of his brothers will someday be bowing down to him and acknowledging him like as their leader and their better, you know, their superior. Uh, so obviously that's not going to make them uh, too happy. And his brother said to him, shall we, in, uh, shall you indeed reign over us or shall we indeed have dominion, uh, ha shall you have in Shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more uh, for his dreams and for his words. Uh, more than what? Uh, more than the fact that the clothes he wore showed his father's favoritism. Uh, more than the treatment, the tattling and stuff like that. So the dreams did not make things better. The dreams made things worse. Now, let's talk about the prophetic significance of this. If this is a prophetic dream, then there will come a time in the prophetic future, either um, uh, after a short time or after a long time, when these brothers will be bowing down to Yosef. 
And uh, as we read uh, further on, we will uh, come to the part of the story where Yosef is in Egypt um, uh, for reasons that we will discuss later in this chapter. But he, but because God is with him, he rises to a position of prominence and uh, and 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 rule and authority in Egypt. And because of a famine, the brothers come down to get some food from Egypt. They don't even recognize their brother, but because he's in this superior uh, condition, this controlling condition, they end up bowing down to him literally uh, to get food. And they do this twice. Two trips are made to uh, to Egypt. So this dream will be fulfilled. This uh, Literally, they will end up bowing down to him. But on the day that Yosef uh, told them about this dream, and, uh, and they interpreted it themselves, it seemed highly unlikely that they would ever be bowing to, down to him because they were all, with the exception of Benjamin, older than him. And because of their age, they were the superior ones. And it would be very unlikely that they would be bowing down to him. So then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. And he said, look, I've dreamed uh, another dream. And this time, the sun, moon, and uh, 11 stars bowed down to me. And again, pretty easy to interpret this. It's similar to the previous dream. Only this time, it includes the sun and the moon. Well, the 11 stars in the dream would obviously be all the brothers except Yosef, because the because eleven are going to be bowing down to the twelfth uh, brother, uh, Yosef. So they understand that part. So who's the sun and the moon? Well, Yaakov himself is going to interpret uh, that uh, for us. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, "What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I?" And your brothers indeed come to bow down uh, to the earth before you. So Yaakov easily uh, interprets this dream, and correctly, because that will happen uh, when the whole family, um, you know, including the surviving wives. So when Yaakov talks about your mother, he's not talking about Rachel because she's already passed away. But the uh, what would it be? The stepmothers uh, in the family will be bowing down, uh, will be bowing down to him. So, uh, you know, the significance of the sun and the moon is that the parents of Yosef will bow down to him. And if it's unlikely that elder siblings would bow down to him, it's even more unlikely that, um, that uh, uh, parents would ever bow down uh, to their uh, children. Uh, okay. So then uh, verse 11, and uh, his brothers envied him. The Hebrew word is kina. The uh, Greek word there is zelos. Uh, and uh, both of these words, kina and zelos, both can mean either jealousy or zeal. Both involve like a passionate attitude about or toward someone or something. Uh, if we talk about zeal, it's kind of positive. It's uh, like a motivating force that makes you do good things. If it is, uh, if these same words are, um, are are translated as jealousy, that's kind of negative, because it, although it does involve passion, it prompts a person or motivates a person to do negative things. So in this, in this case, would you say that kina, the Hebrew word that's used here, uh, to describe Yosef's brothers, would you say it's jealousy or zeal? Well, it's pretty obvious already that it's jealousy, and we'll see how that manifests. Uh, a little bit later, verse 12, then his brothers went to feed the father, their father's flock in Shechem. Now, previously, Yosef was just hanging out with the uh, sons of the neighborhood, uh, God and Asher, Naphtali, and uh, Dan. I think I got all four of them there. But now it seems like 
all of his brothers are going, like all 11 of them are going to take uh, his father's, uh, take a feed his father's flock in, in Shechem, uh, up in the region of Shechem. So, um, so why isn't Yosef going with them? Because it seems like his job is to take care of his dad and not to be shepherding the flocks. So he has the easy home life kind of job with Yaakov, but the other ones have to work out in the fields by day and night taking care of the uh, flock. So that's another reason that they kind of hate him. And it seems like the only time they come in contact with Yosef is if Yaakov sends him to check up on them and bring him back a report of them to make sure they're you know, doing a, a good day's work for the wage they're being paid. Okay, verse 13, and, Yo, uh, and Israel said to Yosef, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, uh, I will send you to them. So he said to them, here I am. Uh, the Hebrew for that is hineni. Um, I can't seem to highlight the whole thing. Uh, Hen kind of means here. And the knee part on the end says, "I like I'm here. In other words, I'm here listening. I'm here ready to obey you. Uh, we come across Hineni all through the Bible. Whenever God calls a person or a superior, uh, you know, calls upon a person, uh, the response is usually Hineni, here I am. Like, uh, uh, Ailey, the chief priest, tells Shmuel, Samuel, when he's a child, uh, that if God calls him, he should say, he nay ni, here I am, send me. So, he nay ni, keep it in mind when God calls you, respond by saying, he nay ni. Uh, then he said to him, please go and see if all is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. Uh, not that he is, seems to necessarily be anticipating a negative report, uh, but that may have been what he would have gotten because there's a precedent and a history of Joseph bringing back bad reports about his brothers. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron. That's where this uh, is mainly taking place. That's where they were living at the time. And he went to Shechem, Shechem. Now, a certain man found him, found uh, Yosef, looking for his brothers, and there he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, uh, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? He obviously was. He could tell by his demeanor. So he said, Yosef said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they're feeding their flocks. And the man said, uh, they um, have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dotan. So Yosef went after his brothers and found them in Dotan. So why did they go to Dotan? Well, one practical reason may be that the pasture lands uh, in the Shem area had been uh, so um, reduced uh, in the amount of uh, food that the flocks could have that they needed to uh, move further north to more uh, abundant uh, pasture. So that would be a practical reason. I think there may be another reason. Because uh, Yaakov, their dad, has a history of sending Yosef to check up on them, and the report is usually bad, and they don't like that. They don't want to get in trouble with their dad. So they probably figured Dad sent us here to Shechem, so he knows we're here. If he sends Joseph to check on us, we'll get a bad report. So let's move somewhere else. Let's go up north to Dotan uh, to avoid our brother, which they would have done if it wasn't for this guy who told Yosef where to find them. So he found them. Uh, verse 18, now when they saw him, the brothers saw him far, uh, far off, even before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. Um, Hamit, uh, I'm sorry, Hamit is a uh, causal form of the word uh, like to put to death or to die. So they are planning to murder him. 
Now, I said uh, before that sina hate doesn't always mean <laughs> hostility and animosity, but it certainly does uh, in this case. So their dispreference <laughs> of uh, Yosef has uh, kind of resulted in, it has uh, brewed into a murder plot. Uh, then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him. Um, uh, harag is another uh, Hebrew word that means to uh, kill. It, it actually means to murder. Uh, it's premeditated murder, as this obviously is. And uh, cast him into some pit. No, actually, I got that wrong. Uh, retzak is, a, uh, is another Hebrew word that means premeditated murder. Harag means like all kinds of uh, killing, but this is premeditated murder. Um, uh, let's cast him into a pit, and we shall say some wild beast has uh, devoured him. Then we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now, uh, this plan can mean several things. First of all, it may mean they're going to throw him into a pit, which sounds like a dry well, uh, which are abundant in the desert. Uh, some seasons in the desert, a well that's been dug will be full of water because there's some rainfall in the desert. Uh, and during the dry season, the hot summer season, um, there's no rain and uh, the underground aquifers are uh, depleted. Uh, so there are a lot of dry wells in the desert. And these wells are pretty deep. And so uh, if they uh, throw him in there, he will not be able to uh, get out of there without some help, without them throwing a rope to him or, or something like that. Uh, so they may just want to leave him in the hole until he dies of starvation or exposure or, you know, whatever. Um, that may be the way they want to kill him. They may be throwing him in the well just for safekeeping until they can slit his throat or hang him or bury him alive or you know, whatever bizarre way they have uh, imagined to uh, take his life. But, uh, verse 21, Ruvain, remember he's the firstborn. He should be the leader of the family, but he's discredited himself. But he's the one who, when he heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Now, it doesn't mean that he took him out of the well or out of the pit. Uh, but it does mean that he said, uh, look, I'm going to use my authority as one of the uh, oldest, if not the oldest uh, brother, uh, to try to influence you guys not to kill your brother. And Ruvain said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, uh, which is in the wilderness, which makes it sound like the reason they put him in the pit in the first place was re because Reuben suggested that rather than slitting his throat or um, hanging him from a tree or whatever they chose to do, hit him with a rock. Uh, so um, uh, throw him in a spit and do not lay a hand on him. Uh, and that's where the quotation ends at the word him. The rest of this is the narrator telling us what Reuben was thinking, that he, uh, Reuben, might deliver him, Yosef, out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So uh, Reuben doesn't want harm to come to his uh, to his brother Yosef at all. So it came to pass when Yosef had come to his brothers that they uh, stripped Yosef of his tunic. So they took off either his long sleeve outer coat or his coat of many colors. I'm gonna say it's both because uh, there, there are legitimate reasons for saying both. So uh, took uh, the tunic that was uh, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Uh, then they took him and cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And that comment is the thing that leads me to believe it was a dry well. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted up their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilad uh, with their camels bearing spices, uh, balm, and myrrh on their way. Uh, to carry them uh, down to Egypt. So um, uh, this is perhaps misleading. The Ishmaelites, remember, are a nation now, or they're a large people group now, and they're living way down south 
um, like in the, the southern part of modern day Saudi Arabia. Now I indicated Ishmaelites on that one map, like living at the southern portion, like down close to the Dead Sea, uh, but they were further south than that. Uh, they were coming from Gilead, which is on the northeast part of the uh, the, the Dead Sea, uh, with their camels. And let, let's go ahead and go to a map here. I, I think one of my maps will, um, will show what we're talking about. Let me see the maps that I've got here. That one's not very, uh, that one's not very good. Well, it is good. So let's just picture the Ishmaelites uh, down a much further south, like instead of up around here, they're way down here, even south of where this map shows. But they have come up north here to Gilead, which is like a mountain range, which is north of the Dead Sea. It is uh, a little bit northeast of uh, Jerusalem, just to put it in perspective. So these ish, but all that, it doesn't mean that they lived in Gilead. It just means that they had done business in Gilead. So the Ishmaelites came up here to Gilead and, uh, and then they uh, left from there. Uh, let me see if I can find what I'm looking for. So they'd come up to Gilead on business and then they traveled across the Jordan River up here to Dothan. Now, Dothan is uh, kind of a key place because there is a highway. Let me move my face out of the way here. Here's the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Jesus did most of his ministry up here, like on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and, he, and he chose that region because there was a major highway that went right across the north and west uh, part of the Sea of Galilee. And then ran down here to Dothan and on to the Mediterranean coastline to all the major cities. It was a major trade route. So since the Ishmaelites started down here in southern Arabia, uh, they were on business. So they came up here to Gilead. Dothan would be a natural place for them to go um, because it's on this highway. The highway was called the Way of the Sea, S-E-A. And Joppa and Gaza are, um, you know, prominent uh, places there. So the Ishmaelites uh, are on a uh, uh, kind of a regular, probably a regularly scheduled uh, business trip that took them to Gilead as one of their stops. And then they uh, continued on in their business dealings to Dothan. So Yehuda, remember, he's the fourth eldest son but the one who hasn't been discredited as Reuben, Levi, and Shimon have been discredited because of their, their behaviors. Reuben slept with his father's concubine or second-level wife, and uh, Levi and Shimon um, just like committed genocide, uh, I guess, on the, uh, uh, the Shechemites to get their daughter back, or their sister back. So Yehuda who hasn't yet been discredited. After chapter 38, you may think he is discredited, but he will be the ancestor of the, the kings. He'll, he'll be the ancestor of the, the noble tribe of Israel. So he said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? So they've decided not to kill him, uh, but they've come up with an uh, alternative scheme. Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. So uh, he is the older brother with credibility. They listen to him, and they decide to sell their brother into slavery rather than murdering him. Then the Midianite traders passed by. This is, the, this is not a different group of traders. These are the Ishmaelites that were discussed a few, um, uh, a few verses earlier. So why are they called Midianites here? Ishmaelites is a reference to a person who became an ancestor of the tribe to which they belong. So it's a tribal reference. Midianite is a geographical 
Uh, Midian is a piece of real estate where the Ishmaelites live. So the Ishmaelites lived in Midian. And as I mentioned before, it's kind of the southern uh, region of uh, modern day Saudi Arabia. So same group of traders. Here they are referred to by their geographical uh, homeland. Um, uh, they, they pass by. So the brothers pulled Yosef up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of, uh, of silver. I think uh, Dake even gives us a kind of a breakdown of how much that is. Um, at $2.50 a shekel, uh, that would be $50 uh, for Yosef. And that would be $25 less than what uh, Judas was paid for selling Christ. So uh, 20, shekel, uh, 20, 20 shekels for Yosef, 30 shekels for Yeshua. And here again is a parallel. It's a type. It's a, a similarity. Yosef is sold uh, by his brothers, betrayed by his brothers, and sold for 20 shekels. Yeshua is betrayed by one of his brother disciples uh, uh, for 30 shekels of silver. So, so they're sold by their brethren. Uh, say. Now, uh, I must clarify that Judas Iscariot uh, was not a blood relative of Yeshua that we know of. Uh, but he was counted as a brother because he was a, a, a part of the discipleship group. And uh, then, as now, um, uh, disciples are, are called brothers by each other and by their master. So the Midianite traders, uh, they pulled him up, sold him for 20 shekels of silver. And they, the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, took Yosef to Egypt. And he'll be, uh, you know, sold uh, in the slave trade there. Then Ruvain returned to the pit. And indeed, Yosef was not in the pit and he tore his clothes. Now, uh, it, this looks like a surprise to Ruvain, and it, and it may have been. Um, it, it, remember, it was Yehuda who came up with the idea of selling him into slavery. So... Uh, when Ruvain finds that Yosef is not in the pit, he's very upset. He may have thought they killed him. He may have uh, realized that he was rather sold into slavery, but he tore his clothes because Reuben's plan was to get Yosef out of the pit and take him to his father and restore him uh, to his father. So Reuben is upset about that. And he returned uh, to his brothers and he said, the lad is no more. And I, where shall I go? <clears throat> so it seems like Reuben felt like it was his responsibility to look after his younger brother and make sure he got safely back to his dad. And now that he doesn't have an opportunity to do that, um, it's almost like his life has no further meaning. Um, you know, where shall I go? It may be that Reuben you know, wanted to take Joseph back to his father, Jacob, and say, um, this kid's brothers were planning to kill him, but I rescued him. Maybe I can win back your favor by doing a good thing after I messed up with your concubine. That may have been the idea. Or it may have just been that Reuben had a moral compass sometimes <laughs> And, um, you know, wanted to wanted to do the right thing. Maybe he loved Yosef. Maybe he was the only one who loved him. The others hated him. So they took Yosef's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, and dipped the tunic in the blood. So what's this supposed to show? It's supposed to, uh, what they're going to tell their dad is that Joseph was attacked by a wild animal and all this blood on his, on his coat of many colors or his Palm length uh, tunic is an indication that he was killed by a wild animal. And uh, all of them know what has happened uh, except Reuben, and now he's going to know, and uh, none of them tell uh, their father. They uh, This is a lie. They're going to tell their dad. 
Um, but all of them decide to go along with the lie. Then verse 32, the tunic of many colors, uh, they, they, uh, then they sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their uh, father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? Well, they obviously know that it is, uh, but this is the way they uh, kind of introduced the idea to their father. And uh, he recognized it. Uh, let's see, what is this? Uh, uh, Kier, yeah. He recognized it and said, uh, it is my son's tunic. Uh, and then it appears that uh, Yaakov goes on to say, a wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Yosef is torn to pieces. Uh, so just by looking at the garment, it seems like Yaakov concludes that it uh, that Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. Maybe the brothers already told him that, um, but he gets the idea. He buys the lie. So then uh, verse uh, 34, then Yaakov tore his clothes. Reuben tore his clothes over because uh, Joseph was gone. Now Yaakov tears his clothes and he put on sackcloth. So tearing the clothes, putting on a sackcloth, which is like burlap. It would be real scratchy against your skin. Uh, and he mourned, uh, 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 he put sackcloth around his waist and he mourned for his son many days. Uh, so putting it around his waist is probably an indication that this was like a, uh, I don't want to say diaper, a loincloth. So it's going to be making Yaakov uncomfortable in a very sensitive area. And, uh, you know, this is a way that he's going to express his, his grief over his son Yosef's death. And he mourned for his son for many days. Later, the law of Moses will define an appropriate time for mourning. Uh, but in these days, I think they just, uh, before the law, I think they just mourned uh, whatever period of time seemed appropriate. Uh, verse 35, and all his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I shall go down to the grave uh, to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now, one thing I want to point out is that the word for grave is kavar. And that is uh, kuf uh, beit resh in uh, Hebrew. Or it, so what would it be? Q-B-R in uh, Hebrew. And that is not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is Sheol. Sheol is a place where the souls and spirits of dead people go. Uh, there is a, a wonderful uh, story that uh, Jesus tells. I think it's a true story of the rich man and Lazarus that gives us probably the most detail about what life in the after, uh, what life after death was like. Um, in the, in the period of time before Yeshua descended into hell. Um, so in the Old Testament era, when a person died, their body was placed in a kavar, in a grave or a tomb. Uh, but the soul and spirit, I mean, the very definition of death in the Bible is when the soul and spirit come out of the body. The soul and spirit are the eternal part of us. The body is the temporal earthly part that returns to the elements from which it was made. So in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, the poor beggar, was a believer, and uh, the unbeliever, um, the rich man, uh, went to Sheol. They both went to the same place, and it was in the underworld. They went down into Sheol, is what the Hebrew text actually says here. Um, the uh, rich man in Jesus' story, the unbeliever, went to a place uh, that he called torments. He says, I'm, I'm in torment here in this place that's characterized by fire and brimstone and things like that. A very uncomfortable place uh, to be existing. Uh, the poor beggar named Lazarus, on the other hand, was a believer, and he went to where all the believers went. Uh, in a place that is uh, called by various names, but one of those names is paradise. Uh, so uh, I think in Luke 16, where uh, the story of rich man Lazarus is told, Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham. He was hanging out with Abraham. 
there in Sheol. And um, it was a blessed place to be, not as good as heaven, not as good as the third heaven, but it was a, it, it was a, much better than torments. And they were in the same general location because they could talk to each other, but there was like a bottomless pit, a chasm that separated the two sides. So you couldn't cross over uh, either uh, direction. So it was kind of the um, the uh, almost the eternal destiny of um, of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, why do I say before Jesus descended into hell? Well, one of the things that Jesus did when he ascended into hell, uh, after he died on the cross, the first thing that he and the repentant thief did was they descended into hell, or Sheol in Hebrew, and they proclaimed victory to the torment side. Uh, which includes a place called Tartarus, where the angels that rebelled um, uh, against God and intermarried with human women and produced the Nephilim, these fallen angels are in Tartarus. Um, Yeshua proclaimed victory there, that they weren't, uh, th these fallen angels were not able to foil God's plan of salvation. Uh, Yeshua was the Savior, and here he was, having victoriously died for the sins of all mankind, and was about to rise again. But the other thing that he did was he went to the good side, to the paradise side, and he took Abraham and uh, Elazar, Lazarus, and uh, all of the other believers who were waiting for Yeshua to come and rescue them from paradise and the underworld. And he did, and according to Ephesians 4, he took them, he took captives in his train, and he led them by way of the resurrection, I think, uh, Matthew 27 verses oh, uh, in the 50s uh, in, in Matthew's gospel, uh, took them by means of the resurrection of the body into the third heaven, which is now called paradise, and that's the place where God lives. That's the Father's house with many mansions. So what is, what is Yaakov uh, saying here? He says, I will you know, my son is gone, so I will go down to Sheol uh, to my son in mourning, to Yosef in mourning. So because his son has died physically, then Yaakov is saying, when my time to die comes, I will, my soul and spirit will leave my body, and my soul and spirit will go to be reunited with my son Yaakov's soul and spirit, in the underworld, in Sheol, uh, which is what he calls it uh, here. And then hopefully, you know, when the Messiah comes, be led to the Father's house with many mansions. So that's what Yaakov is talking about here. I don't think he is saying he's going to kill himself. He is talking about his death. Uh, but after all, he's uh, pretty elderly here. Uh, I forget how many years old he is, but he is a very old uh, person. If he was, what did Dake say, like 99 years old or 97 years old, um, Yosef goes down to uh, Egypt when he's 17. So he would be like about 117 years old uh, when this uh, happened. And he's going to live quite a bit uh, longer uh, than this. So he's talking about the afterlife there. Then verse 36. Now the Midianites had sold him in Mitzrayim, which is the Hebrew way of saying Egypt, Mitzrayim, to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is a title that's given to all the kings of Egypt. It's not a guy's first name. It's a title that's given to the kings of Egypt. Uh, so this guy, Potiphar, uh, was an officer and a captain of the guard. So, um, first of all, let's talk about um, Potiphar, the one who purchases Yosef in the slave trade. He's an officer. The Hebrew word here is saris, and uh, it means a couple of things. Look at the information window down here at the bottom of the page. It does mean an official, which means like he has a job that he works for the king. But it also means a eunuch, which is two very different things. A eunuch is a castrated male. So 
What does Saris mean in this case? Well, it could mean either one. It could mean that he's just an officer in the court of the king of Egypt, the pharaoh. <clears throat> or it may mean that he is a Saris. I think it probably means uh, that he's a eunuch. I think it probably means both. Because what happened in the court of the, uh, like in the palace of the pharaoh, is the pharaoh would have a lot of males working for him as part of his staff, and Potiphar would be one of them. But he would also have the palace full of the women in his harem. And these are women that were, you know, primed and prepared to satisfy the sexual desires of the pharaoh. And these women would be too readily accessible to Potiphar and the other officers in the court. So a lot of times, if you got a job, if you're Potiphar and you get a job with the king and he offers you a very prestigious staff position in his palace, the implication may be, or maybe it was kind of spelled out in the contract, that you are going to be castrated. Uh, so that way there will be no suspicion that you're um, dealing sexually with the king's women, and uh, especially there's no way you'll be able to impregnate uh, any of them and humiliate the pharaoh. So a lot of times these officers uh, were, um, were castrated. He may not have been castrated, but as we continue with the story of Potiphar, um, we may get the impression that he was castrated. Okay, his other kind of title is that of Sar Atavachim. So what is a Tavach? It is a guard. Look at the information window at the bottom of the page. It's a guard. And that's how the, um, uh, the uh, uh, New King James Version that we're used translates it as a guard. He's the, the leader of the guard. But another word is the cook. I'm going to get a little more specific. It's not just the guy who does the baking and stuff. It is a butcher. Uh, a tavak is a person who butchers um, animals for, for consumption. So it is often, uh, or I'll say it is, some, tavak is sometimes uh, translated executioner. So in other words, it's a person who butchers prisoners who have been given a death sentence. So he he may be the Pharaoh's executioner. Um, and so we have a couple of, you know, translational uh, options here. It may just mean the captain of the guard, as simple as that. But it also may be uh, it may be that group of men in the, ca the, the Pharaoh's guard that executes uh, prisoners when they get into trouble. So, um, you know, as the story develops here with uh, Potiphar and Yosef, uh, we will uh, we'll see how it develops and come to some conclusions about whether he was a eunuch and whether he was an executioner or not. And of course, that brings us to uh, chapter 38. And as I mentioned in the intro, uh, in chapter 38, the focus is going to shift to Judah and his uh, sons. And, uh, uh, and, and Judah's part of the genealogy of the Messiah. Uh, that's kind of all I'll say about it now. And then in 39, it's going to shift back to uh, Joseph. And from 39 on, it's going to be the story of Yosef. And we'll talk, talk about you know reasons for why uh, that perhaps might uh, be the case. So uh, since we've been studying the Old Testament, let me give you an Old Testament blessing. If you are Jewish and are offended by the um, uh, pronunciation of the sacred name of God, uh, turn off the tape now before you get the blessing. Um, but we will say the sacred name. Uh, this is from Numbers chapter 6, and I believe the context of Numbers 6 kind of requires that the sacred name be spoken because the the priests who were giving the blessing were to place the Lord's actual name 
on the people when he blesses them. And that's what I want to do for you. I want to place the sacred name of God upon you. So here we go, the uh, called the the Birchat uh, HaKohanim, uh, the, the blessing of the priests. Uh, I will give that uh, to you in the language that it was given, the Hebrew language. Yivarechacha Yahweh vayishmarecha, Ya'er Yahweh panav elecha vayuhunecha, Isa Yahweh panav elecha vayasem lecha, Shalom. Let me also give that blessing in uh, English, so you'll know what I said there. And I will use the substitute Lord for the sacred name when we do it in English. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Uh, shalom, dear friends. Hope we'll see you next time for our study.